Praise be to the Lord, for he has heard my cry for mercy. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in him, and I am helped. My heart leaps for joy, and I will praise him in song. Well, friends, let's begin by doing that together as we praise God by singing the words of our first hymn, Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father.
Let's now continue together in prayer. Our God and Father, we thank you that you are our strength and our shield. That times without number we have cried to you for help and you have drawn us up, you have made our mountain stand strong. And so we call to you now in our distress, confident that you will be with us, that you will strengthen us, that you will help us and uphold us by your righteous right hand. For you are our God, our King, our Redeemer and Saviour. And we thank you that through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, you have redeemed us from sin and shame and slavery. That he suffered the cross, that he bore the curse for us. That we might be justified in your sight and adopted into your family as beloved children. How we praise you that you have turned our mourning to dancing. That you have loosed our sackcloth and clothed us with gladness that we may sing your praise and give thanks to you forever. So help us to do so now, here and in the midst of trials. Remind us that we have an eternal home, one not built by human hands, in which we shall dwell with you forevermore, that we have a glorious inheritance, imperishable, undefiled, unfading, that we have treasure in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy, and that our citizenship is in heaven and we are waiting for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And so as we wait, would you teach us once more that nothing can separate us from your love? Would you remind us that none can snatch us from your hand, for you are greater than all, and great is your faithfulness. There is no shadow of turning with you, for you do not change, and your compassions do not fail. And so our hearts trust in you, and we are helped, and we give thanks to you, and we pray to you now in Christ's name. Amen. Well, friends, let me welcome you to this, our Sunday broadcast here at Holyrood Evangelical Church. My name is Ewan Dodds and I serve as the Associate Minister and on behalf of our church family can I welcome you here today. We love to have guests among us and so whether you are watching online or listening over your phone line, you are very welcome. This morning we have two guests taking part in our broadcast. In a moment I'll hand over to Lorna Ferguson who has sent a video update of her situation. Lorna was recently among us on home assignment and has since returned to Japan and she will be sharing something of the challenges and the opportunities that she and her team are facing during the present crisis. Later in the broadcast I'll welcome Robert Murdoch from the Faith Mission Bible College. Robert is a friend of the congregation and he will be ministering God's word to us from the prophet Isaiah. Just a couple of notices for the church family. Firstly, it's a prayer meeting week, so look out for the Zoom codes that will be sent to you ahead of Wednesday evening. And secondly, we want to thank God for his grace shown in the recent generosity during the Safe Families Appeal. We had hoped to raise somewhere in the region of £2,000 to help families with food coupons and the like. At the end of the appeal, we have raised over £4,000, and so we thank God for laying that burden on people's heart and for his grace shown through their generosity. We pray that he will bless that gift and multiply it, and we pray that many will be blessed on account of it. But I'm going to hand over now to Lorna. After Lorna has spoken, we'll sing together our children's song, which we sang last week, we just want to ensure everybody knows the words. Uh, thereafter, Alistair Roberts will come and read the passage from Isaiah. He'll pray, and we'll sing again, and then Robert will come and preach to us. Hello, everyone. It's great to be part of your service today in this way. I was really looking forward to being with you in March 
But as many of you know, Alistair and I decided to come back to Japan early when we realised that flights were getting more difficult due to the coronavirus. In fact, we got back to Japan just before they introduced new border restrictions and quarantine. So we definitely felt that God opened the way for us to come back when we did. Then in early April, uh, Japan declared a state of emergency. What that means here is that each of the 47 prefectures can make its own rules and guidelines and requests. Unlike in Scotland, they can't force businesses to close or they can't force people to stay at home. They can just ask us very politely. So we're asked very politely to please stay at home and only go out if it is urgent and necessary. When we do go out, we wear masks. Again, that's not compulsory, but almost everybody you see will have a mask on, but not in the house. And so that, now that that means I'm working from home, I've taken over uh, Callum's bedroom as my home office. For OMF, uh, some of my work looks quite similar to before. So we're still uh, working on the prayer booklet, trying to get the text of that finalized and then getting some Japanese input. We had been hoping to publish that in June, but now we're going to wait until September. Another part of my work here is that I am on the task force dealing with the coronavirus. That means that we need to keep up to date with the news in the eight prefectures where we work, keeping up with the guidelines so we can advise our members on what they can and cannot do, the different ways that they can do ministry. So most of our members just now are staying at home and just like in Scotland, ministry is being conducted online by Zoom or other technologies. And some people are finding that actually really encouraging and that more people are joining into the Zoom meetings than joined into actual in-person meetings before the state of emergency. So we're definitely seeing God at work in some ways. It's been a big learning experience for me to have to follow intricate Japanese news every night as to what's happening. Definitely my vocabulary is getting better. Um, still much to learn and we need much wisdom as we advise our members. Some of our members are looking to go back to their home countries on home assignments, but are not sure if there will be flights. Japan's also introduced very strict border restrictions. So people from most countries now can't come back here. So some people are also stuck at home, not sure when they can come back here. Missionaries are a very moving population back and forward. So suddenly not being able to move to leave Japan or to come back to Japan has meant a big change for us all and looking to help people through that. In all of this, we are looking for more opportunities to share our faith in Jesus with Japanese people of the hope that we have that the Lord is the one who is in control of all of these things. Another part of my work is with the local church. You might have heard me talk about wanting to be more involved in my local church when I came back. Well, I didn't know that would happen quite as quickly as it has or in the form it has. Once the state of emergency was declared, uh, my local church moved to online services and they asked me to play the piano for that. Now, unfortunately, I am not up to Hollywood standard, but it's still great to be able to serve in that way. The pastor also decided it would be good if we could send a short written devotion by email to all of the church members each day. And I've been asked to write one of those every week in Japanese. So that's another challenge for me, but it's a really good thing to be able to do to encourage our members at this time. By our prayer meeting has moved to Zoom, just like the one at Holyrood. And also I'm trying to keep in touch with the members of my youth group by messaging app to encourage them to share how things are for them and that we can pray for each other at this time. From a family perspective, we're on three continents, which uh, adds added complications since each place has different rules. Matthew and Callum at the moment are doing their end of year exams in online format and waiting to see what happens over the summer. Both of them ideally would like to get some jobs for the summer, but we don't know if that will be possible. Callum might look at coming back here, but again, we don't know if that will be possible. I think we're all reminded at this time that although we might make our plans, it's the Lord who guides our way. And so we trust him that he at the right time will provide whatever we need to do whatever it is he wants us to do. So just some prayer requests. Um, if you could pray for us here in Japan, please pray for wisdom for the task force as we make decisions that they would be helpful to our members, that we would be good witnesses here in how we respond to the requests from the government. Pray for more chances to share our faith with people, not in person, but by using messaging apps 
or by giving them a call to show the hope that we have in Christ, that we serve a God who already knows the future. Um, please pray too for my local church. The pastor is very busy at the moment. Please pray for him and pray that the church could really be salt and light in the community at this time. And likewise, that church members would be encouraged and encouraged to share their faith with other people. And then finally, for a family, that all of us would look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, that we'd put him first, that we grow as disciples and that we trust him for all that we need at this time. Thank you very much. for today teach me how to choose your way help me lift my eyes to see who you are you are faithful always true every good thing comes from you meet me in your word and help me worship you it's a new new day to read from Isaiah chapter 41 reading verses 8 to 14 but you Israel my servant Jacob whom I have chosen the offspring of Abraham my friend you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its father's corners saying to you you are my servant, I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, I will help you, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Behold, all who are incensed against you shall be put to shame and confounded. Those who strive against you shall be as nothing and shall perish. You shall seek those who contend with you, but you shall not find them. Those who war against you 
shall be as nothing at all. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not, I am the one who helps you. Fear not, you worm Jacob, you men of Israel. I am the one who helps you, declares the Lord. Your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Let us join together in prayer. Let us come before the Lord. We remember the words of our Lord and Saviour. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Saviour. We thank you, Lord, for these promises which you gave to your people Israel. We take them on our lips and ask that you would write them on our hearts and minds in this present day. We come before you this morning to give you, our Lord and Saviour, our praise and worship as a company of your people gathered under the sound of your word this day. Will you guide us and direct us? Will you be to us that pillar of cloud by day and pillar of fire by night, which did not depart from before your people in days of old? Lord, be with us. We bring our prayers and petitions before thy throne this morning. Will you hear and answer? For our world, Lord, lead them to the rock that is higher than I, to that strong tower against the enemy. We pray today for those who are suffering, for those who are sick, for those who are anxious, for those who grieve, for those who have no saviour. Will you minister to them through your people? For our country, Lord, for the Prime Minister and those in government, those making decisions, guide them in these days. We would pray too for our Queen and the Royal Family, guard and protect them. We do remember all who are involved in the fight against COVID-19, the National Health Service, the health managers, nurses, paramedics, volunteers, our armed services and the police. We bring before you our own people in our fellowship who are in this work. We would pray for churches for our own church and churches up and down the land where your gospel is faithfully preached week by week. We remember you and before you and the eldership with the weight of responsibility at this juncture. Remember the vacancy team, Lord. Give them unity in the spirit and grant them your wisdom. And finally, we would pray for our minister today, Robert Murdoch, bring in your word. Give him liberty and grace this day. And pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Through love. 
It is nice to be with you in Holyrood Evangelical Church. I'm grateful for the kind invitation to be part of your service. I'm really disappointed that I couldn't be there in person as uh, we had planned or as I had planned. Um, but in these unprecedented times, it's still nice to meet together in, in this way. Now, I'd like to look with you this morning at Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. Um, the passage has already been read for us, so let me set a little bit about uh, a little bit uh, of the context in place. Isaiah was an eighth-century prophet, so he reigned, or didn't reign, but he prophesied from around 740 to around 701 BC. His prophetic ministry spanned the reign of three of Judah's kings: uh, Jotham, Ahaz, and the better-known Hezekiah. You'll remember from uh, Isaiah's book that it's in chapter 6 that he records his call into the prophetic ministry. Uh, in the year that uh, the king, King Uzziah, had died, he was given this vision of the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled uh, the temple. And in the middle of that vision, uh, he heard the Lord say, Whom shall we send and who will go for us? And Isaiah responded by saying, Here am I, send me. And he was thrust out then into his ministry as a prophet. His ministry was directed mostly towards the southern kingdom of uh, Judah and the people of Jerusalem, not exclusively so. He has some things to say to the uh, nation of Israel, the ten northern tribes in the north. Um, and he also has something to say to the nations surrounding Judah, some of the other uh, nations. But primarily his uh, ministry is focused towards the southern kingdom of Judah. Two aggressors are in the background in the book of Isaiah. For the first 39 chapters, the aggressor is Assyria, who will eventually overrun the ten northern tribes, or Israel. And then in chapters 40 through 66, the aggressor is uh, Babylon, who will eventually destroy Jerusalem, 586 BC. The, the dominant theme in the first 39 chapters of the book of Isaiah is uh, the theme of judgment and condemnation. God's people had become idolatrous. Um, they were giving their devotion and worship to uh, things that were not God. And not only had they become idolatrous, but they had also become uh, corrupt. The poor were being exploited, and uh, God's people were a long way removed from the light that they should have been to the nations. Now, the southern kingdom uh, that's in Isaiah's sights were following largely 
the people of the southern kingdom were following uh, in the footsteps of their brothers and sisters in, in the north. And by the time that we reach chapter 39, it seems that the north had already been taken capti into captivity or at least scattered to the wind by the Assyrians. But uh, the prophet Isaiah really predicts um, that the same kind of judgment will fall upon the people of Judah unless they mend their ways. They would be dragged across the desert, uh, he tells them, some 500 miles to the great city of Babylon, where they will be settled in prisoner of war camps by the river Kibar, where no doubt they uh, lived in tents and kicked up dust and had a fairly miserable existence, at least in those early days. Now, by the time that we reach um, Isaiah chapter 40, the whole mood of the book uh, changes. And so instead of the themes of condemnation and wrath and judgment, the, the prophet begins to focus on themes like salvation and restoration. And the change is instantly, the change in the mood is instantly recognizable uh, when you turn over the, the page in chapter 40 because you read these words, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, says the Lord. Speak tenderly to the people of Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed and her sin has been paid for. Now, um, in this section that we're looking at in Isaiah chapter 41, the prophet is writing on God's behalf to the people of Judah who are now in captivity in, uh, they're in exile along the banks of the Kibar River in Babylon. And as they begin to uh, wrestle with all that has happened to them, the destruction of Jerusalem, them being carried off uh, into exile, as they think about the greatness of their enemy, as they begin to think about their future and what it might hold, the prophet writes to encourage their beleaguered hearts. Uh, they will begin to wonder how they will ever survive this exile. What will become of them? The darkness and the difficulties uh, that they have experienced will begin to envelop them. And uh, they'll wonder if they will ever recover. And so God inspires the prophet Isaiah to write these words of comfort to them. Don't be afraid, uh, the prophet says. Fear not, for I will be with you. And uh, God will help them. God will strengthen them as individuals and as a nation, and he will uphold them whilst they are in exile in Babylon. And the remarkable thing about that is that they had sinned, they had become idolatrous, they had given the devotion that only God should have been the focus of. They've given that devotion to other things, gods that can't see and can't hear and uh, can't speak. But they are still God's people. And God still loves them, and he hasn't given up on them despite their failings. And he will remain faithful even when they have been unfaithful. Sometimes sing the song, don't we? Great is thy faithfulness, O oh God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. And uh, that was certainly true of Israel. Um, God had been faithful to them. He had been faithfully gracious. He had been faithful in his mercy. And he's going to be faithful to his promises, his covenant promises. And uh, he's going to be faithful to his people. Isaiah chapter 41 is one of, I think is, 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 is my favorite text in all of the scriptures. In some senses, I, I uh, often think of it as my text. Of course, it's not my text. It's in the scriptures. It's everybody's text. But it is a text that I've run to again and again and found comfort in. And I pray that my few uh, thoughts on it this morning will be a comfort to you. Now, uh, Isaiah gives his readers a number of reasons uh, for not being afraid and full of despair. And there are three of them in this text. They are not to be afraid because they have the Lord's presence. Secondly, they are not to be afraid because uh, they are the Lord's possession. And thirdly, they are not to be afraid because they have the Lord's promises. So first of all, they are not to be afraid because they have the Lord's presence. 
Fear not, says the Lord, through his servant, for I will be with you. That's the assurance that the prophet Isaiah gives to the people of Judah as they find themselves uh, in Babylon, living in prisoner of war camp effectively, uh, uh, tents along the, the banks of the Kibar Canal or the Kibar uh, River. And the assurance is that as they find themselves in this darkness and despondency, the assurance that the prophet gives to them is that the Lord has not abandoned them and that the Lord is still with them. Now, uh, the Israelites uh, would have thought of God's presence as being present in the temple. God manifested his presence, revealed his presence in the Holy of Holies, uh, just beyond the curtain uh, above the Ark of the Covenant. That's where God's presence was manifested. But the temple has been destroyed. But the God of the temple has not been destroyed. And here he promises that he will be with them in this pagan country and in this pagan city. And, and the, the, the prophet wants them not to be fearful and not to be full of despondency and despair because he wants them to know that in the uh, difficulties and darkness of their circumstances God will still um, be with them. The Lord's presence I think has been one of the great blessings of the Lord's people down through the centuries. Uh, you weave your way through the Bible and I think again and again the thing that strikes you which marks God's people is, is God's presence. So Joseph, chapter 30, Genesis chapter 39, verse 2, sold by slavery, sold into slavery by his brothers, brought down into Egypt um, by those Midianite traders, uh, sold on the slave trestles, finds himself a servant or a slave in Potiphar's house, falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, ends up in a dungeon in prison. And yet it says in Genesis chapter 39 verse 2 that the Lord was with Joseph and he prospered. And that's why he rose to the heights of political success in the way that he did. It was because the Lord was with him and he prospered. We think about Moses uh, the great lawgiver, and he's uh, on the backside of the desert, minding his father-in-law's sheep, Jethro's sheep. And uh, God speaks to him from a burning bush and tells him that he's to go back uh, down into Egypt. And of course, he doesn't uh, feel that he uh, can go back into Egypt because there's a price on his head. He killed an Egyptian with his own bare hands. How in the world could I go back to Egypt? And, and remember what the Lord said? Well, I'll send you on a leadership course. No, that's not what the Lord said. The Lord said, I will be with you, Moses. Exodus chapter 3 verse 12. Remember Joshua. And he has the task, the onerous task, of following in the shoes of this great leader, Moses, uh, who led the children of Israel out of Egypt. And uh, God taps Joshua on the shoulders and says, uh, on the shoulder and says, I want you to lead my people into Canaan. And uh, Moses, or Joshua must have been quaking in his boots as he thought about how could I ever fill the shoes of this great leader, this great man of God. And remember what God said to him? God said to him, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you in, in uh, Joshua chapter 1 verses 5 and 9. That's the assurance that's given to uh, Joshua. And the same can be said of so many of the Bible's characters. We think of the disciples as Jesus gathers them together on the mount, uh, mountainside in Galilee. And he commissions them to go into all the world and make disciples of, of every, in every nation. And uh, what's the promise? Uh, that they'll be sent on a church planting course with Acts 29. No, the promise is, and I will be with you uh, always. I'll be with you always and to the end of the age. That's the great promise that is given to the Lord's people, that God will always be with us and that he will never leave us or forsake us. And I want you to take some encouragement from that, no matter where you find yourself in life. No matter what your circumstances are, regardless of how dark the night is that you're passing through, no matter how fierce the battle is that you're engaged in, 
God is with you and God will always be with you. Where can you go from God's presence? Where can I go from God's presence? The psalmist asks. If I go up into heaven, you are there. If I go down into the depths, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and fly to the furthest reaches or to the to the, the far side of the sea, even there, your hand uh, will hold me. And uh, we'll discover that God is there before we ever arrived. I have a friend who's a street preacher in Bournemouth. And uh, he told me on one occasion a story about how his wife was really despondent that the church that he'd been asked to be pastor for evangelism with uh, didn't really support him in his work and he was on his own going out onto the streets. And his wife said to him one day at the breakfast table, so you're going out again today alone? And uh, he said to her, no, I'm not going alone. There'll be four of us. Oh, she says, who's going with you today? He says, there'll be me. And then there'll be God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And uh, we may want to discuss the whole Trinity, three uh, persons and one being, uh, unity and Trinity and so on. But we can get his point. No matter where we go, no matter what we do, God will always uh, be with us. May we live every moment of our lives as though God were there with us, because he is. May I preach every sermon as though God were listening, because the truth is, he is there present listening. May we carry out every action as though we are carrying it out in the very presence of the Lord. And although we're locked up and some of us uh, don't have others to spend time with, I just want to give you this comfort and this encouragement that the Lord is with you this morning in your home. You can't see him, but he's there with you. And uh, I remember speaking at a conference some years ago and I met a young family from um, a group of islands known as Vanuatu. Uh, and they used to be known as the New Hebrides. And it reminded me of John Payton who left, I think it was Dunfries, and he arrived in the New Hebrides on the 5th of November, 1858. Three months later, his wife gave birth to their first son, so that's February 12th, 1859, just three months after they arrived in the New Hebrides. Then, on the 3rd of March, his wife died. 17 days later, their little boy followed uh, his mother into the grave. And of course, Patton or Peyton uh, buried them with his own hands. And he wrote in his journal, I would have gone insane kneeling at those lonely graves, but for the sweet fellowship of Christ. And I want you to know that uh, you have the sweet fellowship of Christ no matter where you are. Secondly then, uh, they are not to be afraid because the Lord will be with them. And secondly, they are not to be afraid because they are the Lord's possession. And it says uh, in verse 10, do not be dismayed. Don't be full of dismay because I am your God. In essence, God is saying to the people of Judah who find themselves in exile, living in this prisoner of war camp, you belong to me. And I belong to you. These people were God's people. And uh, not only did they belong to him, uh, but he belonged to them. God created them. Uh, and we're told that he gathered them from the furthest corners of the earth. And God created them and brought them into being as a nation. Um, God walked into Ur of the Chaldees and, 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 and tapped Abraham on the shoulder and said, I want you to step out on a journey of faith, a moon worshipper, a pagan. You read through those early chapters in Genesis and you're, you're left with the impression this man is a pagan and yet somehow God calls him into a life of faith and he steps out on a journey of faith with, with the Lord and he, God promises to bless him and make him a great nation. And take him to a land that he will show him. He promises that uh, he will bless everyone who blesses Abraham. And curse everyone that curses Abraham. God brought this nation into existence. Out of all of the people groups in the world. Uh, God set his love upon this man and his descendants. 
and committed himself to them in a covenant relationship. Not only had God created them, not only had God brought them into existence as a nation, but uh, God identifies himself in verse 14 as their redeemer. When they found themselves uh, in, ex uh, in, in bondage in Egypt and uh, in slavery, baking bricks for the Egyptians and building cities under the searing heat of the Egyptian sun and throwing their baby sons into the, uh, to the, to the crocodiles on the river Nile. They cried to the Lord and the Lord redeemed them from Egypt. He bought them back and brought them out and rescued them from the tyranny that they were experiencing. God created them. God had redeemed them. And, and God had remained faithful to them even though they had been unfaithful to him. And uh, what is true of Israel is surely true of us. God created us and formed us and God has redeemed us. With the precious blood of his son, a lamb without spot and without blemish. God has showered his unfailing love upon us as his people. I think uh, the Lord's relationship with his people is wonderfully illustrated in the story that is told in the book of Hosea. In Hosea chapter 3, the prophet went down to the slave market and there his adulterous wife had dug herself into slavery and was being sold. She had left him and uh, she, it seems that she'd been unfaithful to him and she's being sold. And uh, there the prophet is standing and someone starts the bidding, 13 shekels of silver, someone's prepared to play. And, and before the prophet knows what he's doing, he shouts 14, I'll pay 14 shekels of silver. 15, says someone, uh, I'll, I'll pay 15. And then you think, Hosea is starting to really think, what else can I gather up to buy back my wife? And he says, well, I'll pay 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a half of barley. As he tries to think of things that he could uh, offer to purchase his wife. And he buys her back and he brings her home and, and he loves her. And uh, that's what God has done for us. He's bought us back from the slave market of sin. And we've become his possession. And he has become our God. He's redeemed us. When we became Christians, a new sign went up uh, over the lintels of our heart. And it said, under new management, God took over the ownership of our hearts and lives. We're no longer ruled and dominated by Satan and sin. Now we belong to the Lord and the Lord belongs to us. And I think that's one of the greatest encouragements of the Christian life, that we belong to God and God belongs, God is our God. Remember the story of Job and an intruder had uh, come into the presence, uh, had presented himself along with the sons of God in God's presence. And, and God begins to engage this intruder and says, have you considered my servant Job? Um, who is upright and who sh hates evil and 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 the, and Satan says to God, yes, I have considered him, but the reason that he uh, blesses you and worships you is because you have blessed him and put a hedge of protection around him. But if you allow me to penetrate that hedge, then you'll see the real Job. And then God says, well, I'm going gives Satan permission to penetrate the hedge of protection. And we could say a ton more about that. But the thing that strikes me about that story is, why did Satan have to ask for permission? Why didn't he just penetrate the hedge? And it seems to me that you can't touch the Lord's possession, possessions without the Lord's uh, permission. Remember the story of Peter in the upper room and Jesus says, Simon, Simon. Satan has asked to sift you as wheat. Now I read that story and I think, well, why did Satan ask to sift Simon as wheat? Why didn't he just go ahead and sift Simon as wheat? And it seems to me that you can't touch the Lord's possessions without the Lord's permission. So I just want to leave you with that thought, that it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to be able to say, I am my beloved's. And he is mine, and his banner over me is love. What an immense privilege is ours as Christians. And uh, 
some of you might be listening uh, to this and uh, and you maybe don't have this kind of assurance. Um, I want to tell you the wonderful news that you can enter into a relationship like this through Christ this morning. Through Christ you can enter into this kind of relationship with God so that you too can say in your heart, I am my beloved's and he is mine and his banner over me is love. So the second thing was they were not to be afraid because they were the Lord's possession and the Lord was their possession. Thirdly, they are not to be afraid because they have the Lord's um, promises. And there are three of them in the text. The first one is that God promises that he will strengthen them. Now as the Israelites looked out at the strength of their opponents, the Babylonians, they must have wondered how will we ever recover from this exile and this enslavement. The future was bleak. But the future is only bleak if God is taken out of the equation. For those of us who are Christians, or let me put it like this, for those of us who are the Lord's people, the best is always in front of us, never behind us. The best is always in front of us. And that's largely because God is part of the equation. And here uh, the prophet is encouraging them uh, and reminding them that God will strengthen them. Uh, they'll not be destroyed by the exile. God will give them courage in the midst of this mayhem that they find themselves uh, surrounded by and uh, mayhem that they find themselves in. And you think about how that promise of God through the prophet Isaiah to the people of Judah in anticipation of all that they would face. Think about how that was fulfilled. Remember the three boys in Daniel chapter 3 and uh, they refused to bow down before Nebuchadnezzar's golden image and uh, they, they were threatened and told that they would be thrown into a furnace and still they refused to bow down before the king's image. You can heat the furnace. We're not bowing down to your image. The only person that we will bow down to and worship is Yahweh. And, and you ask the question, well, where did these three Hebrew boys get the courage to speak with such a docet, uh, uh, with, with such um, audacity to, to uh, this um, Babylonian king? And it, the answer can only be God gave them uh, the courage and the strength that they needed. And uh, I'm not sure who it was that said, God gives dying grace to the dying, but I think it's true. God gives strength when it's required. We think about some of the martyrs that, and uh, individuals even in this very city that we uh, live in. You think about people like Alan Cameron sitting in the Tollbooth Jail in Edinburgh when the dragoons burst in with a head on the end of a dagger or on the end of a spear. And they said to the old man, do you recognise it? You can read this in Fair Sunshine, a little Banner of Truth book, and he takes the head and he kisses it and he says, Do I recognize it? He says, It is my son, my only son. And then he launches into this whole soliloquy and he says, And it is the Lord who has caused goodness and mercy to follow me and mine all the days of our lives. And you read that and you ask the question, how can a man respond like that when they have thrown their worst at him? When they have done the worst that they possibly could to him, how can he respond like that? And you have to say it's because the Lord gives strength. How could someone like Helen Rosevear endure all that she endured and not become an embittered soul? It's surely because the Lord gives strength as our days so shall our strength be. That's the promise of Scripture. As your days, not just the length of them, but the nature of them. Not just the number, but the nature of them. As your days, so shall your strength be. And then secondly, the second promise is, uh, not only will he strengthen them, but God promises that he will help them. Help them. Even at her best, Judah was no match for the Babylonians, even if every man in Judah was fighting fit. There was no way that they could break free from their captivity. And there was no way that the return from the exile that the prophets 
predicted would ever take place. But God is promising here that he'll help them. It's not all down to them. He's promising that he will help them. God will arrange the unthinkable uh, when, the, when the time is right. Uh, in the tiny state of Anshan near the Persian Gulf, uh, a king will emerge by the name of Cyrus and he'll throw off his overlord and he will, in, he will inherit the empire of the Medes and he'll overcome the Babylonians and one of the things that he will do when he comes to power is he will repatriate the Hebrews and give them access to the cedars of Lebanon and give them all the help that they need to rebuild Jerusalem, rebuild the temple as he sends them home to pray for him. And of course, God will raise up leaders like Zerubbabel, who will lead the Israelites or, or the people of Judah home from exile. And folks like Nehemiah, who will rebuild the walls of the city of, of Jerusalem. So what, what God is promising is that he will be their helper and that all of the things that has been predicted will come, will come to pass. It's a great thing, isn't it, to know that it's not all down to us. And that our helper is none other than Yahweh, the God of heaven. One of the most precious memories I have of my grandfather was when he was dying in St. John's Hospital in Edinburgh or in, in Livingston. And uh, he, he was dying and uh, I went to visit him and I leaned in close to listen to what he was saying as his lips were moving. He had gangrene and the whole system had become poisoned and uh, he was delirious and on occasions he was more lucid and I saw his lips moving, wondered if he wanted a drink of water. I leaned in close to listen to what he was saying and this is what he was saying, repeating after, uh, time after time he was repeating these words, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? That's the promise. I'll help you. We forget about the times that the Lord has helped us in the past. And if the Lord has helped us in the past, will he be any different in the present or the future? God is our helper. And then finally, the final promise is, I'll uphold you. God would uphold them as a nation in captivity. They could have been lost in a sea of despondency forever. Even on their return back to uh, Jerusalem, they could have been destroyed by bandits and, and never heard of again. But, but God promises that he will uphold them and that he will carry them. Even when they got back to Jerusalem and faced the opposition of Sambalat and Tobiah in the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem and the other Samaritans. God's promising that he'll hold them, that he'll carry them. I, I think when many of us look back on life, we will see that there were times when we were unable to carry ourselves. We didn't have the strength that we needed. And we'll look back and we'll see that there were only one set of footprints in the sand and they weren't ours. In fact, they were the Lord's. When I was minister of a church in Canada, I used to look out on a sea of faces. And in that sea of faces, I could see people who had uh, lost their spouses. Some of them had lost their children. Some of them had lost their jobs. Some of them had lost their business, businesses. Some of them had lost their health. In my mind's eye, I can see one gentleman that used to come and sit at the back going through chemotherapy, lost his health. But they kept coming every week, despite all of the things that they had suffered. And they had suffered enough to snuff out their faith forever. But they kept coming and I used to ask myself, why do these people keep coming and pressing on with Jesus? And I think it's because of the truth of this verse. It's because the Lord upheld them, because the Lord strengthened them, because the Lord um, helped them, and because the Lord upheld them or carried them. And I want you to know that those promises relate to your life, that the Lord will help you that the Lord will strengthen you and that the Lord will uphold you. Well, the three things that we have looked at today uh, have been fairly simple. We looked, first of all, at um, 
the fact that we're not to be afraid because we have the Lord's presence, I'll be with you. We're not to be afraid because we have we are the Lord's possession. I am your God. We have a covenant relationship with God. And then thirdly, we're not to be afraid because we have the Lord's promises. So those are some uh, words of encouragement I hope that will be a blessing to you during this period of lockdown. I want to thank you for the opportunity to be with you and I'm going to hand back to those who are in charge now. So thank you very much. Well, we thank the Lord for the great words of that great hymn. 
And above all, we thank him for his word, which was so faithfully ministered to us by our brother Robert. Let's then go into the weak, trusting in God, who is our shield and our defender. Let's continue to pray for the work of Safe Families for Children and for our sister Lorna in Japan. And as we close our time together this morning, let's say together the words of the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.